I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with Zachary Drucker and Nick Camilleri, the directors of The Lady and the Dale, uh, a fascinating docuseries on HBO. And, and Nick, I want to start with you because I, had, I will admit, after watching this series, I don't know how to feel about Liz Carmichael. It's a very, she's such a complex figure. Um, is that one of the things that kind of attracted you to her as a subject? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think she's probably one of the best anti-heroes I think I'd ever seen. And I have a huge affinity for anti-heroes. I think a lot of the scripts that I write and a lot of things that I'm attracted to are the, those, I think, trying to balance good and evil and, and finding, finding the way between those two sides and trying to navigate and reconcile them. And I really appreciate for all of Liz's faults, all the good stuff that she did. And I think that's what made it really interesting is the kind of the oscillating ups and downs of not only her life, but the most fascinating part to me, which is like the Dale, the ups and downs, which is, oh, we have the money, but we don't actually have the money. It's like, oh, we're gonna put this thing together, but we may not put it together. And it's, and watching those two sides of her, I think come into conflict uh, in very pivotal moments, it's very, very interesting to me. So Zachary, when, when Nick, I, and I, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, Nick, you kind of, Zachary, you had never heard of Liz Carmichael prior to this. So when yeah. <laughs> when you start looking at this at at this woman, you know what what goes through your mind when you're exploring a woman like this? You know, Liz, is, there's no easy way to uh, kind of qualify her journey as a protagonist. She is so many things. She is an antihero, but she's also um, a trailblazer in in so many mm -hmm. ways. I had not heard of Liz. I was very skeptical at first because you know there are so many gender expansive people through history who have had an impact and Liz you know was really kind of lost to the sands of time um, if you didn't know anything about her and were just going on the press the, you know the media coverage of her from her time you wouldn't have even known that she was trans I mean she was flat out characterized as a man masquerading as a woman to commit a crime. Um, mm. So it's no surprise that she was written out of history broadly and trans history as, as a kind of sub, you know, sub genre of history. But I was always captivated by um, her kind of complicated nature. And I think <laughs> that good uh, characters are complicated and, and have to be complicated. I mean, we're only fascinating when we um, are able to live in our full complexity. And I think trans people mm -hmm. for so long have been relegated to these very kind of um, tidy narratives. Liz is, you know, counter counterpoint to all of that yeah and mm. and nick it, it, one of the most fascinating things about this is that as part of kind of the and and zachary hit on it about the you know her transness was really kind of set aside um and many people really tried to even kind of mute it with the aptly named uh, dick carlson um who really emerges as kind of the the, the, the true villain of this piece, uh, comparing her to Jeffrey Dahmer. First of all, how did you get Nick Carlson, to, uh, Dick Carlson to even talk to you? Uh, well, I guess to answer that, that first part of that, which is like, I would say to jump on what Zachary said, which is you said she was kind of not even recognized as trans for I think the first five years, I just kept running into the same half dozen people who kept saying, she fooled us all. This is one of the greatest con artists of all time being like the con being her identity. And then every article you would read would be, would be denying her of her identity. And I kept saying, well, she lived for the last 25 years as a woman. And mind you, I, I'm not really immersed in the LGBT community, but I'm like, well, the evidence speaks for itself, which is why would you choose to live as a woman the rest of your life? And, and despite that, and they would keep saying, it was a con, it was all a con. And so, so to, to, unpack I think and, and to kind of move forward into that realm which is I always just from jump street was like she's a trans woman that's it it's like and you just move forward and let's move forward to everything else but to to jump on what you said which is like to the Dick Carlson thing that was a little bit more difficult I think um they're behind the scenes 
drama, but that led to, we were supposed to film his interview in 2013, 14, and then it didn't happen. Um, but when we had conversations about it, I told him what he wanted to hear, which was that <laughs> I said, you're the hero, sir. This is your story. This is about you. This is, you know, and it's, I hate to, my producer Madison will hate me, but I'm going to quote Socrates here and say that like irony is the key to ingratiating yourself with someone using irony as a, as a lasso to pull somebody in. And that was a lot of what our conversation was, is like, I ended up, I was actually on the road to Pittsburgh and we were driving back to New Hampshire. I was out of money and we had no time. And one of our cam, I think one or two of our cameras had broken and we were, at, we were heading back to New Hampshire. And I said, I'm just going to get Dick Carlson. And so I, ended up sending him email after email with a bunch of stuff because we were just at the Museum of American Speed. And I sent him picture after picture after picture, all these emails saying like, here's you and Pete cracking the case and here's you doing this and here's you doing that. And then by the time we entered the DC city limits, he had agreed to an interview. And it was really about like, we want to tell your story. It's never been told before. Let's hear it from your perspective. And to his credit, and maybe something that doesn't appear on camera, but I will be fair and say he was always, he was a pleasant person with me and, and very nice and agreed to the interview and gave us that, that hour and a half. Is the, the, the use of animation in this documentary is so, I think, it, it's strangely beautiful I, to me. I, I, I found myself just absolutely engrossed by it. How did you guys manage to pull that off? Well, you know, it was actually a necessity due to COVID and everything kind of <laughs> shutting down. We had to really find, you know, creative solutions for the restraints, the constraints of finishing the project on time. And animation lend itself really well to the limitlessness of, of Liz's grandiosity and imagination and ultimately our kind of framework was to think about how Liz would tell her own story. Um, so we were thinking that she'd be cutting things out. It'd be like jagged edges and everything would be very tactile and paper-based. And ultimately we arrived at a very kind of do-it-yourself type of storytelling, <laughs> you know, using the kind of photo collage as a truly, I think, genre breaking um, strategy for, for telling this story. Um, there was very limited source material. I think any, any discerning viewers out there will see that we had a limited amount of, of film footage of like archival footage of Liz and very few photographs of her. Um, she really avoided publicity and avoided being photographed for all but one year of her life. Um, and that year, of course, is, you know, amply uh, documented in the second and third episodes. It's kind of the bulk of the action in her story. Um, but yeah, otherwise we had to really create, I think, a, a world using animation. And um, it's chock full of inside jokes and and. <laughs> obvious jokes and um you know we spent so much time reviewing animation in post and looking at you know these composite frames of you know the things that animators were working on and we were just able to embed a whole um other layer of, of information and context about those that yeah i think it's very like hypnotic and and beautiful and uh you know, expansive like Liz was. I love, I love the animation. It just, it just, it just captures you much like Liz did. And when I, one of the things that I think is just so fascinating about her is that she is this amalgamation of things of, you know, yes, she, she was a con artist to a certain degree. There was a certain, I think, kind of narcissism within her, but at the same time, she was extremely loving with her family and very devoted to her family, and her family is equally devoted to her, um, was, was the experience of getting in contact with the family, was that challenging? Were they willing to talk? Were they eager to talk about Liz? No. <laughs> <laughs> it took no. a lot of... Um, um, yeah, yeah. yeah they, I mean, I started, nobody in the immediate family would um, 
I, I reached out to Jerry Bouchard, Liz's granddaughter, I think, because that was the person I had the most in common with, I think. And I knew that the Michael family was very close. And we had a discussion, I think, over about a year where I was saying, this is what I'm trying to do. And here's what I'm trying to do. And basically said that like her story had really never been told before, like not in the truest sense, like it had always been chopped up and handed back to us. And so to ingratiate myself to get into the castle walls, I think was incredibly difficult because it was a lot of me pushing and pushing. And uh, I guess to use the term continuous action, which was, it took not just myself, but it took Jerry Bouchard, Nathan Michael, it took our producer Madison to an extent Zachary. It took me. It took everyone basically saying um, it, it. But it, I think I would say most of it came down to Candy's son Nathan, who I talked to and kept saying repeatedly, "Your mom's the only one who can really tell this story, and she's really the only. She's really the only family member who's old enough to have experienced everything and had really the storytelling capability to be able to." Um, discuss and not only discuss but emote and, and talk about everything in a very open and honest way and Nathan was really I give a lot of credit to Nathan because he was the one who really had that conversation to say if you don't tell this story somebody else is going to and and Candy kept saying it's not my story to tell it's not my story to tell and then Nathan basically said to her it is like this is your story like you are Liz's daughter like you have to tell this and it was because it was Candy didn't want to do it because of how dark it was and everything had kind of been, been turned on them. Every time they talked to the media, they would just screw them again and again and again. And I had to keep saying to them, I'm not a journalist. Like I don't come from the news world. Like I, like I tell them I'm a screenwriter. That's you know, like a writer, director. I'm, I'm not from that world. And I think it was a lot of all the things I named that it wasn't just one thing, there's no silver bullet. It took everything and it really, I mean, it wasn't, we didn't get Candy's interview, I think till what, November? or December of 2019. It was very late in the process, but it took a lot of years and groundswell and continuous action and everybody all at once. Do you think we're in a different place with the media? Because I think one of the lessons of this film is how the media really, uh, again, tried to silence you know, Liz's transness um, and use her transness as a weapon. Um, have we progressed beyond that? Are we getting better? Where do you think we are in that process? Yeah, I would say our media landscape has evolved quite a bit. My mother was a reporter in the 1970s, 80s, and into the 90s. And I have a tremendous amount of, report, of respect for, for journalism. Um, I think Dick Carlson is such a compelling um, villain in our story because he really is asking good questions. He is scrupulous. He is um, digging deep to really, you know, find out more about who Liz Carmichael is. And then you come to realize that it's steeped in bias that's very personal and um, that it kind of goes beyond the, um, the exalted objectivity of, of journalism. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a great kind of ball of yarn to, to watch. And then of course, you know, Carlson's connection to our current media culture. So, you know, I always say, Tony, that the future is both better and worse simultaneously and that progress um, moves alongside opposition. And I think of the story of Liz and Dick as a humble beginning point, as a humble microcosm of what's become, you know, a national and global conversation around the rights of trans folks. It's very bifurcated at this point. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's hard to even generalize about the overall media landscape, but one curious thing is that from Carlson's perspective, there was a media um, preference or there was a media, there was a way that the media treated trans people with kid gloves. And uh, in his interview, I don't think we included it in, in the ultimate final cut of, of the series, but his view was that the media favored trans people. And that <laughs> he was the antidote to that. So um, 
you know, okay. it's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's also the incredible thing about, about telling a complex story like this is that you create space for all of these disparate positions and opinions to coexist and coincide and to contradict. Has, has there been any, because, you know, because Liz is such a complex uh, figure, um, has, were you ever concerned about how the trans community in general would react to this story, uh, whether they would embrace her or, you know, whether they would, you know, maybe want a more quote unquote wholesome representation? I mean, did that ever cross your mind in creating this? Never. <laughs> no, I'll say that, you know, it did, I'm joking, it did cross our minds. Um, you know, it, it's always hard to gauge what a community will, how a community will respond. And we're such an expansive and diverse community that, you know, it's, it's really, I think the story is for everybody, truly. And that trans stories are truly some of the most um, resilient and inspire and they're, they're most inspiring stories of resilience you know in so many ways um and there's something in everybody something for everybody in liz's story um mm -hmm. you know i'm thrilled that you know people in the lgbtqi community have embraced the show and um equally thrilled that you know the, the world at large has yeah, and I, I'm, oh, yeah. No, go ahead, Nick. Oh, no, I was going to say, I would jump off that to say, like, Candy was very concerned. That was one of the reasons she didn't want to do the interviews, because she was very concerned, because despite living in a liberal city, in a conservative state, who lives in Austin, you know, it's, she was very, very concerned that her friends and her employers would very much have a distaste for her participating in this. She was like, I don't want my, you know, I don't want any of this to be threatened or any of this have negative harm. But she said that when it came out, she said everybody embraced her and everybody was people that she thought would be the worst or were some of the kindest people in the world to say like, we understand and we get this. And they say, this helped us understand a lot. And it was kind of what Susan said, which is it, it does a lot of pedagogical work. It's a teachable mm -hmm. work. And that, it, and that when um, Zachary says it's for everybody, that even the most conservative people were able to see it from a different vantage point and understand and even in, to go one step further, which is that the Barrett side and the Michael side, because of, of Liz's uh, checkered past, um, they didn't really talk. Um, and this documentary actually reunited those two sides because they watched the documentary and said, I understand now everything that was going on in a way I didn't before. Yeah. And so these are completely different sectors or factions of people who all came to the same understanding, which I think is like a real, an actual real achievement. I completely agree. It is, you know, quite an achievement and, and quite just a magnificent uh, and important, I think, series. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, and stay tuned for more interviews with contenders throughout the season. Nick Camillary, Zachary Drucker, uh, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.